Welcome to Legacies, a journey through the interesting lives of elders. My name is Roberta Robinson. I'm Director of Marketing and Outreach for the Geriatric Division of the Cambridge Health Alliance. This program is done in collaboration with SCAT TV and the Cambridge Health Alliance. We often meet people and we have no idea what challenges and what lives they've led. We thought it would be a good idea to showcase some of our elders so that they can share their experience, strength, and hope with you. Today we have Pam McLaughlin. Welcome, Pam. Thank you, Roberta. Thanks for joining us. Pam is a Somerville resident. Yes, correct? I am. How long have you lived in Somerville? 47 years. 47 years. Mm -hmm. And before then? Uh, I was in Boston. In Boston. So Pam has had a very challenging life. Would you care to share it with us? Yes, I certainly will. Um, when I was 11 years old, uh, there was a big polio epidemic in Boston. It was 1952. And on August 15th, uh, I got up and fell to the floor. And my mother, being a nurse, suspected it was probably polio. And two days later, I was taken to Children's Hospital. And um, I was placed two days after that in an iron lung. So and can you explain a little bit what that Sure. You're encased in a metal iron lung, and it breathes for you. Only your head is, um, you know, visible. And uh, I was in there for many months, paralyzed. So the polio affected your lungs and your breathing? Yes, from the neck down, I was completely paralyzed. Oh. And I was there for quite a few months. And um, w what they would do is take you out slowly, 15 minutes at a time and they'd start building you up. It took until February before I was completely out. And polio is a very painful disease. If you can think of the worst arthritis, it just goes all through your body. And it was February or March before the arthritis, the polio left. And I remember the doctors came in one morning and they had me stand up. And then they started to give me extensive physical therapy and I learned to walk with Canadian crutches. Those are the forearm crutches. And on May 9th, 1953, I walked out of the hospital. Wonderful. Yes. Well, that is an inspiration in itself right there. So, and then you went on. You, I did. Um, I went to the Cotting School for the Handicap, which was on St. Patal Street in Boston, and it was wonderful. And, Does it uh, still exist? Oh, yes. yes. They're in Lexington now. It's called the Cotting School. And they're very advanced with handicapped children, and they do marvelous things with them. And so I was there, and I completed my freshman year at the high school, and I went out and got my first job. And I worked for the Record American, which is now the Herald. Mm -hmm. And I had learned how to type my freshman year. So I made a dollar an hour, worked 40 hours a week, <laughs> typing names and addresses. And, uh, but it was a very good experience because it taught me, if you want something, you go out and you work for it. Mm. And uh, so the years went by and I graduated in 1958. And I always wanted to be a nurse like my mother, but with my condition, I couldn't. Mm. So I um, went to Fisher Junior College uh, only one year, because it was all secretarial work, and I had learned that in the four years I attended the Cotting School. So then I went out and I got a job. I had wonderful jobs. And um, I remember I worked for the um, Boston Stock Exchange for 10 years in the executive office, and they were wonderful to us. There were five executives and five secretaries. They gave us great bonuses at Christmas and always treated us with respect. Wonderful. Yes, and... Um, those were the days. Those were the days. And then I moved to Somerville in 1972, and um, my daughter was uh, just five years old. We lived on Somerville Avenue. Mm -hmm. And um, about eight months later, I had to go to the doctor. He discovered cancer. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to come in and right away have an operation, but I had pneumonia. This was in September, and he said, um, well, the pneumonia has to be cleared up. It took until Thanksgiving. He wanted me to come in. I said, no, Christmas is coming. I didn't know what was going to happen to me with cancer. 
-hmm. had the uterine cancer. Mm -hmm. So the day after Christmas, I went into the hospital, Central Hospital, had a hysterectomy, came home, and within six weeks, I was back at work. Oh, I thank God for that. And now, where were you working then? The Boston You're Stock still there. Exchange. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, about three years passed, and I happened to pick up a Somerville journal, and it said there was a smelting plant almost across the street from where we lived on Somerville Avenue, and uh, it was sending chemicals up in the air. A lot of people got sick with cancer in that area. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had to go back to the doctor. And there were a lot of young people there. One was a 26-year-old uh, mother with three children, and she passed away. But I survived, and I thank God for that. Mm. Yeah. So then um, how long did you stay at the Stock Exchange? You Ten years. Ten, and then you took another job? Oh, then I took another job, and uh, then I worked for the Cambridge Visiting Nurse Association. I was the receptionist for uh, five years. Mm -hmm. And then I worked for the Somerville Cambridge Elder Services 10 years. I ran their medical escort program. Wow. Had 100 clients in their 60s, 70s, 80s. And it was a wonderful job. I really enjoyed it. And I loved my clients and took care of them. So you had an incredible business career. I did. And, but, and you tra you've traveled oh, as well. Oh, have right? I ever. You know, it was very interesting. Um, my Aunt Catherine lived in New Hampshire, and every time I visited her, she had a beautiful, big, gold-framed picture of St. Michael the Archangel. And I, I don't know, I was just attached to it. And uh, one day, I was 23 years old, 1964, and um, I happened to turn to the travel section. I saw a picture that she had there of St. Michael. And it was a three-week grand tour of Europe for something like $495. And I had about $700 in the bank. I said, I'm going. And I told my mother I was going. She said to me, Pam, do you think it's safe? I said, Ma, after what you went through in the war, absolutely. I went, and I had a wonderful time. And I never stopped traveling for 43 years until 2007. And you used your crutches to yes. do this? Yes, yeah. I did. Yeah. Went all over, mainly Europe. Went to Scotland and then Canada and different places, but mainly Europe. Mm. Loved it. I think you had mentioned to me that you were at Medjugorje as well. Oh, right? yes. I've yes. been there where the Blessed Mother has uh, yeah. appeared. And I've been to Fatima three times. And I think back to Fatima when Our Lady appeared to the three children and in 1917 on May uh, 13th. And she said to them, World War I is going to end. But if people do not repent and convert, there's going to be a far greater war. And she said, a signal will be given, a light. And on the evening of January 25th, 26th, 1938, this tremendous light appeared over Europe. People thought it was the end of the world. And some people thought it was Aurora Borealis. Two months later, Adolf Hitler marched into Austria and World War II began. Mm. And you know, we still haven't learned anything. We've had Korea, Vietnam. We had four people in Vietnam and, you know, the Mideast crisis and different things that have gone on. And I think the problem is people, a lot of them aren't bringing their children up in a faith that's very important. Because I know from looking over my life, I could not have gone through what I've gone through without my faith. I, I, and I appreciate that. You have, uh, and so you haven't stopped there with just retiring from some of no. the Cambridge Elder Services. No. You've then have a, another career that I began do. to bloom. And it's a gift. Uh, my mother was a U.S. Army nurse from Mass General, and during World War II, nurses were in great demand, and it was only the Army that would accept women with children. I was two years old when she left on Easter Sunday, April 25th, 1943, for um, Africa. And when she got there, they were being bombed, uh, the heat was 125 degrees. Wow. They slept on the ground in the beginning. General Rommel had just left because he got sick and had to go back to Germany. And it was at this time she started writing letters home to her family in Boston. And up in New Hampshire, she uh, was brought up in Tamworth. And it's about 30, 40 miles south of North Conway. And um, after she died in 1989, and her sisters passed on, 
we discovered a hundred pieces or more of her correspondence and they were given to me. And I read them over and I said, this is a piece of American history and we don't want to lose it. So it took me a couple of years to put the book together. I'd come home in the afternoon for my job and start working on it. But the book came out in 2002 and it's been quite popular. There's been 34 newspaper articles done and I, oh, I've made 100, let me see, 106 talks. I, I think I went to every assisted living in New England. I went to Scotland with it and Ireland. Wow. I'd been on television and uh, it was interesting to look back. And I took a copy to the Historical Society in Concord, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and they were amazed. They said, we have nothing on World War II. And I said, often when I give a talk, people come up to me afterwards and say, oh, you know that old stuff, we threw it out. I said, you threw out a piece of American history. Mm -hmm. So the people are either hanging on to it or, you know, disposed of it. Right, right. But we don't want to forget what our veterans have done. I always wear a flag in memory of them. Mm, yeah. Wonderful. So you have, so you're an author. Yes. You've mentioned the book. Yes. You've actually written a, a couple of books. Yes. And you are on your third book. Yes. Right. And how that happened, after I retired in 2007, the next year, 2008, Father's Day was coming up, and my grandson lost his father when he was two and a half. And I wanted to write an article he'd remember his dad by, and I titled it Remembering Daddy, and the Woman Advocate published it. So far, they've published over 85 of my articles. Wonderful. And my second book is A Glass Heart, An Inspiration of Love. And it's really my memoir in article form. Mm. And um, my grandson is on the cover with a dog. He just loves dogs. And uh, he's been an inspiration, certainly, for me. Wonderful. Yeah. And you've, you've been very involved in his life since. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, you continue to write yes. for the Woman Advocate, yeah. the Somerville Journal? Yes. Any, any? And my, f my second book has 43 of my published articles, and I have enough articles for a third book. That's wonderful. Yeah. So even though you had this uh, uh, dreaded disease mm -hmm. of the 50s, you uh, rose above it. Oh, absolutely. Right. I have a strong faith. My mother had such a strong faith and so did her mother. Mm -hmm. um, her mother was Marianne McGilvery, and the McGilvery's were from Arasig, Scotland. And in 1646, there was a tremendous battle over there. It was the Catholics and the Episcopalians against the English. And the Catholics were led by Alexander McGilvery, a descendant, and um, he was killed in battle. The English won and they forced um, the Scots and the Episcopalians out. They had two places to go, either Australia or Canada, and my family chose Nova Scotia, Auntie Kanish. And my grandmother, when she was 24 years old, in 1898 came to Boston and uh, with a strong faith, and she worked for a wealthy Beacon Hill family, and um, they used to have beautiful homes up in the Tamworth Chicago area of New Hampshire. And my grandmother one summer went up there to work for the family. She met my grandfather, uh, Edward Silas Hammond, and he was English. And uh, they fell in love, and they were married at Holy Cross Cathedral in 1901. And then they returned to New Hampshire, he had a beautiful home, and he was an only child, and uh, raised um, eight children. The first one they had in the winter time. Uh, was stillborn, mm -hmm. and they couldn't bury the child, so my grandfather built a little coffin for him, and then in the spring he was buried. But he was a wonderful, I have wonderful memories of my grandfather. That's and wonderful. my mother's family, very close-knit, the sisters, you know, my aunts mm -hmm. and uncles, and they were an inspiration for me. Mm. So most of your life you uh, I got around on these, uh, with these crutches, yes. these Canadian crutches. And um, today you're in a wheelchair. Yes, I had an accident about 15 years ago, and that's what put me in the wheelchair. Mm. But I don't let it stop me. I get out every day. I use the ride. I gave up my um, license to drive about four years ago. I drove for 34 years all over. 
mm. with a hand control car. And you still have a full life? Absolutely. And you have um, your family, which yes. is, you rather have a rather close-knit family. Yes, we do. And um, which has helped, been a strong Tremendous. support system, I'm sure. Yes. And, and you've been that support system for your daughter and your grandson oh, as well. Oh, absolutely. So since, you know, he did not have a dad. No. And you probably filled in a lot of those gaps. We did. Yeah. In fact, um, people said to me, oh, he'll forget about him. No way did he ever forget about him. Yeah. Well, good. Because, uh, you know, they live on. They in do. In our hearts. Right. So you um, get out every day yes. and you go to places like... I go to the Woburn Senior Center. I always go to St. Anthony Shrine on Tuesday. I have a great devotion to St. Anthony, and you have Mass, and afterwards they bless you with the relic. And um, I keep the faith. That's very important. I don't think I would have made it if I didn't. In fact, I just wrote an article um, on, it's called Bright Lights for the Future. And my grandson took the high school exam, and he came out as being one of the top U.S. students across the United States. Wonderful. That was wonderful. And um, I wrote the article. I have no computer ability. My grandson thinks Nina's kind of weird <laughs> because of that. But um, I type up my first draft, and then the next day I'll type up, type up my second draft. And so you're still using a typewriter? Yes, an IBM Selectric, the best machine they ever made. <laughs> and I had a very interesting experience. I was going to call this article that I was writing about uh, the kids. We were invited to uh, Malden Catholic to a scholarship brunch. And my grandson received a $5,000 scholarship to go there. He will be going there. Wonderful. And um, so when I came home the next day, I was writing up the article. I was just going to call it a scholarship brunch. But what happened was next morning I got up and I said, you know, God, I think I'll call it Bright Lights for the Future which I did, and when I did that, I was still laying in bed. My desk is across the room, and I have one of those lamps that you tap three times, it goes up to the highest level, and went up to the highest level all of a sudden. And I knew that was a confirmation from God that these kids are gonna make a big difference. I always believe in our children, mm -hmm. and many of them out there, and I believe in the future, they are going to stand up and take our nation back and straighten it out. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. So you have um, the articles you write. We mentioned the Somerville Journal, the Woburn Advocate, but is there a third? Um, I, I seem to remember there's a third paper that you write. For. Well, I did not really. In the beginning, I did a um, couple of papers out in Woburn, uh, the pilot for the Archdiocese, but mainly it's been the Woburn Advocate, and now the Somerville Journal has been picking them up. Hmm. So you have the books, and yeah. you, um, I, I see a medal on the, on, on the table there. Yes. And can you tell us a little about that medal? Yes, I can. Um, my mother, when she arrived in Africa, as I said, they were being bombed, and she got hit in the back of the neck. She always had a big scar in the back of her ne neck. I remember summers, she'd be peeling carrots or potatoes in the sink, and she'd have her summer dress on. You could see the big scar. Mm -hmm. So she got hit, and, um, but she recovered and then went on to um, Italy. And uh, about 15 years ago, I contacted um, Mike Capuano yeah. and his aide, and they helped me get her a Purple Heart. And I had never seen one before. And uh, so it's something beautiful to keep in our family. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and during World War II, 16 nurses gave their lives. And uh, I always feel nurses never get the recognition they deserve. And that was another reason for me to publish the book. So tell us a little about the book. Well, it tells our family history in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And as I said, nurses were in great demand. And only the army would accept women with children. And when she went over there, the heat was 125 degrees. They're being bombed. They slept on the ground. And they had a lot of patience. And I'll read you a couple of quick excerpts. And as I said, she went arrived. She left on a naval ship um, on Easter Sunday. And this one is October 14, 1943. And she, she was writing to her sister-in-law, Lottie, up in New Hampshire. She said, nothing much new here except rain, rain, and mud. The only pretty things are rainbows, beautiful sunsets, and moons between the heavy rains. 
She said, we had our first death in the 53rd tonight, and we've handled over 3,000 patients, which is an excellent record. She said, keep writing, and if we move, I'll receive it somewhere, someday. She said, how is Pa? Tell him I'm fine. And she said, they bought a pig somewhere, and we had pork chops, and were they delicious, how we devoured them. And uh, she would ask for me and wonder what I was doing. She said, I can't wait to get home and see Pammy. And, oh, this is interesting. February 6, 1944, Italy. Sunday, 3 p.m. She was writing to her sister Mary, and she said, at your convenience, would you go into Filene's and ask to see the Army nurses summer beige fatigue dresses around $14 and also a beige overseas cap like my blue one. She said, price them and Catherine will send you the money. That was her sister who was taking care of me. I lived with her and her family in Keene, New Hampshire. And um, she said, I just came back from the 12.45 p.m. mass and we took pictures of ourselves on the way back. And she said, um, after you write for so long, there's nothing much that you can say. But she said, send my love to everyone. So, so these letters basically are a journal, absolutely. almost a daily journal of That's, what her life was like yes. during uh, the war. Right. In Africa. Right. Yeah. And then you wrote a second book? I did. Um, I realized after I started writing the articles for The Woman Advocate, People said to me, well, why don't you put them into a book? And I said, oh, I don't have enough. But as they kept publishing, I realized I did. So my second book has 43 of my published articles. And the name of that is? Well, it's interesting how I got the name of it. One day my grandson was over. It was a Friday night. He was staying over. And he was five years old. And we're watching Wheel of Fortune. I said, Jesse, what would you do if you won all that money? He said, Nana, I'd buy mom a flat screen TV. I said, would you buy Nana anything? And he looked at me and without hesitation, he said, Nana, I'd buy you a glass hat. Hmm. And I thought about that. And it's my memoir looking back. And I, so the title of my book is A Glass Hat, An Inspiration of Love. Wow, that's yeah. wonderful. And so you have gone on and you've had um, a miraculous life, really, in the face of all your challenges, mm -hmm. and you've had many. Not only did you have the polio, but you had the cancer. Mm -hmm. And in those days, the cancer uh, was um, uh, a, basically a death sentence. It was. Right? It's interesting you should say that because about a year ago, I was telling a nurse, and she said to me, that was fatal way back then. Fatal. So I knew... You know, God was with me, thank God. The well, obviously, way. you were supposed to go on, yeah. and you were supposed to do many other things. Right. And so this is a way that we show that you, in, in spite of all the challenges, uh, that people can overcome and still have fulfilling lives. Absolutely. And so I think it's wonderful. And thank you so much for coming on board and sharing it with us. Thank you. Yeah. We hope, we see that Pam has... Uh, shared her experience, her strength, and her hope. Hope for all of us that no matter what we ailments we might have or conditions we may be in or under, there's, there's always a ray of light and always a way to do something positive for ourselves and to have a fulfilling life. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope to see you next time.